Well, hi everyone. I think I have an interesting video for you today. A lot of you have commented that you like the hands-on engineering videos related to my collection of deep foundation test data and how we analyze it. So I have another one of those here today, but it's an area that I haven't covered previously very much uh, relative to our services. So I've got this project in the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and it's going to involve drill shafts and driven pile, and I've covered testing of those types of foundations in past videos. But also there was a scope item to do seismic refraction surveys. So I'll get into what that is, why they want it done, explain how the data is collected, and go over the results that we obtained. It's quite interesting. So as I mentioned, this project is for a pedestrian bridge just north of the city market in Kansas City, Missouri. This is the location where we performed our testing. And this just gives you an idea where the job site is located relative to the Kansas City metropolitan area. So we did this work on Saturday, May 24th, Memorial Day weekend. The reason we did it on the weekend was that we didn't want nearby construction activity by the contractor generating vibrations that would interfere with our data collection. It would just create noise in essence. So. We went there on Saturday and, and got uh, some good results. All right, we're at a new job site, construction of a new pedestrian bridge adjacent to this roadway bridge. They've removed the superstructure already. And our job is to tell them how long the pile extend below the bottom of this pile cap. They're gonna excavate around it so we have access to the top of the piles and we'll do sonic echo testing at a later date once they have it exposed. So today we're using seismic refraction to determine the depth of the bedrock between these two bent locations. Okay, so I've done one, possibly two videos on sonic echo impulse response testing. The previous video I did was to determine the condition of a drill shaft during construction where it wasn't possible uh, due to problems with the CSL access pipes to perform a CSL survey. So that's a real interesting aspect of this project that I'll cover in a video coming up here in a week or two. So next I'm going to show you the basics of the field data collection for seismic refraction. It's my son getting ready to take a, a shot here. All right, so my son was lining up the strike plate, he uses a 16 pound sledgehammer to smack the top of the plate. So that impact generates a compression wave that transmits through the ground and that wave is both refracted and reflected. And with an array of sensors, in this case geophones, which are essentially accelerometers, spaced at a, at a set distance along the survey line, we're able to analyze these reflections and refractions and determine the profile of the subsurface. That is, how much soil there is, what the depth is to the bedrock contact, the different uh, layers within a zone. You know, you might have denser soil layers, uh, relatively soft soil layers, and that sort of thing. Now, you've got some fundamental conditions or assumptions that need to be present to do this seismic refraction work successfully. And as I mentioned, you want velocities of the various layers to generally increase with depth. The layers have to be thick enough to be detected or resolved in the analysis. And the layers' seismic velocities are varied enough that the individual layers can be identified. So in the application of soil over bedrock, it's a great application for seismic refraction surveys. Yeah, so right now we're running a line that's uh, in line with all the substructures. We're trying to see the variation in depth to bedrock um, you know, throughout the site because, you know, they weren't able to get borings at each of these locations. Okay, so I got to jump in there. They did borings all throughout the area. They didn't do borings at the two locations where they expect to or hope to reuse the existing pile supported pier cap. Ideally, we want to run more horizontal lines, um, but the access is rather limited as far as where we can get, um, you know, some geophones in here. So this is where we're gonna start for our first line. Now let's look at a diagram of the existing caps here. There's two of them that are being considered for foundation reuse for the new bridge. 
So the ones we're investigating, you saw in the background of the initial video footage for this site, you have a cap that's 15 by 15 in plan. It's five foot thick and it's supported by a number of 18 inch diameter steel pile that are filled with concrete. So as I mentioned, we're gonna come in later on when they've created access and attach sensors to the side of some of these piles and we'll do sonic echo impulse response testing to determine the length of those piles and to see if those pile lengths correspond to our interpreted depth to bedrock. So obviously the designer here wants to confirm that the existing piling is in good condition and that it in fact extends to bedrock uh, before they consider uh, reusing them for the new bridge foundations. All right, let's run some more field footage. Okay, he's striking the plate which sends a compression wave into the ground and that wave reflects and refracts. He'll do a rather sophisticated computer analysis to get it all sorted out in terms of the depth of the bedrock as well as the characteristics of the soil above the bedrock. That was three. It says stack eight. It says stack one. So we're doing our strike location at a bit of an offset. You know, ideally you want to do it the offset that's about equal to the distance between the geophones. But this is just um, you know a nice flat area that we can do it. The reason why you want to offset offset your strikes is so as the wave propagates, you can have really clean first breaks. Again, he's carefully checking his data as he's collecting it. One day of field work equals another two or three days of analysis back in the office. All right, now we're gonna determine how much noise is generated by the passing train relative to our data collection. So, uh, if you heard that discussion there, striking the plate with a hammer, that's active seismic refraction data collection. You can also set up the array of geophones and collect data passively, and that is from the vibrations from ambient activities like the passing train. In this case, since we're collecting active data, the passive noise, as it were, is not something we want to have. So later on, he wasn't striking the plates and just let the train run by for a few minutes and collected passive data. Well, the data was too noisy with the passing train, so now we know. Gotta collect it. No well, train going by. There's ways you can process it. A little noisy. He's gonna try and collect passive data off the train passing here later. Until you just don't marry it. You have to tell people what to do. That's right. <laughs> I'm an official photographer. In case you're wondering, the reason why I wasn't swinging the hammer is uh, I'm on a 10 pound lift restriction following my abdominal surgery back in April. So uh, normally I wouldn't let my wife swing the hammer, but we really needed her help. All right, and this is what the seismic refraction profile looked like. So on the left here, we have this high velocity layer. This is compression wave velocity. I think it's an old footing from a previous iteration of a bridge there. So we have to really ignore that. Out in the middle is the area between vents three and four. And we can see that in general, the parent transition between 
overlying soil and the top of weather bedrock is at a depth of roughly 23 to 25 feet, which matches what the estimated depth of bedrock was based on interpolation from the adjacent borings. Again, those borings were rather widely spaced and in some cases didn't go all the way to the bedrock. So this is why they wanted to have this seismic refraction survey performed. My son also used a different type of analysis called MASW to analyze the data. And it produces an overall average uh, transition between the overburdened soils, the compacted clays and gravelly soils overlying weathered bedrock at a depth of about 25 feet below ground surface. There's a great article, and again, I'll put links in the description to these sources of information, but MASW stands for multi-channel analysis of surface waves, and there are both active and passive methods for generating that data. And I'll just read a brief excerpt here. The conventional seismic approaches for near surface investigation have usually been either high resolution reflection or refraction surveys that deal with a depth range of a few tens to hundreds of meters, usually in the oil and gas realm. Seismic signals from these surveys consist of wavelengths frequencies higher than 50 hertz. The multi-channel analysis of surface waves, MASW method, deals with surface waves in the lower frequencies, that is 1 to 30 hertz, and uses a much shallower depth range of investigation that is a few to a few tens of meters. So it's a perfect application for a site like this. Shear modulus is directly linked to a material stiffness as one of the most critical engineering parameters. Seismically, shear wave velocity, V sub S, is its best indicator. Although methods like shear wave refraction, downhole and crosshole surveys can be used, they are generally less economical than other seismic methods in terms of field operation. So I just wanted to touch on that briefly. Well, I hope you found this to be an interesting video. We certainly had fun doing the work and, and making the video. I'll do a follow-up here soon when we've collected the sonic echo impulse response data to determine the length of that existing piling under these two caps and compare those links with our interpreted depth to bedrock and uh, just tie it all together. But I wanted to get this video out there because I think it's very interesting. So with that, I want to send a shout out to those of you who have contributed to buy me a coffee. That's, as usual, a great way to support the channel. And certainly I want to send a shout out to those of you who are channel members, those of you who have contributed to Super Thanks, and have left comments to my various videos. So thanks again, everyone.